you know, when I went for my treatment, the day the doctor tells me that you have 30% chances of survival, you're on fourth stage. And at the end of it, when I look at my smartwatch and I see how much, and I've walked 10 kilometers, and I'm like, you know what? When this is what I've heard, and if I can walk and if I can do this, I'm going to survive it. I was so angry. I was like, you know, I've left everything behind. You've not let me, you know, even shut things down or, you know, I don't even know if I'm going to come back. That was the scary part. As, you know, the bloated face, the scar, and the baldness, and especially when the hair just starts coming. It's just the most ugly sight on the top of your head. You know, it's really not... Uh, but I did that and um, the point was, uh, uh, I said that the moment you're scared of something and you're feeling that, no, 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 how can I do this? I need to go out and do it. Zandir has been uh, asthmatic as a child, so he just reaches into his backpack and takes out his pump and uh, takes a, uh, you know, because that obviously anything, any stress kind of triggers that off and he takes his uh, medicine, puff of that and, um, and he just, uh, sits there absolutely quietly. Being skinny was definitely not the standard of beauty. So voluptuousness was the standard of beauty and you were just not woman enough if yeah. you were not uh, voluptuous. In life, you brave through a lot of challenges. It may make you better or bitter. The choice is yours. Similarly, the choice is also yours, whether you want to come out as a victim or a victor. Today, I have somebody who I wanted to speak to for the last two, three years. And I understood her reasons for not being able to do an interview. But she's always been a survivor and she channelizes that energy, that positive radiance around her. I'm a 90s kid and for me, she'll always remain an emotion. Welcoming Sonali Bender in conversation with me only on her story season three on Bollywood Bubble. Thank you so much, ma'am. And I have to say that for any 90s kid, whoever is sitting here, they will say that you've been an emotion and you re continue to remain an emotion today. Uh, the whole system has changed, but I think 90s ka maza hi alag tha. <laughs> Is baat pe to kisi ke bhi lu. You know, you've always been very vocal and honest about your experiences. Yeah. Um, when the news of you uh, being detected with cancer came out, I think everybody got a shock and I remember, I, I have to say this. Yeah, I got a shock too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you also treated it, you also dealt with it head on. Did you, where did you get that courage? Were there no moments of fear? Of course there was. I mean, you know, how can you not be? Uh, there was a lot of fear also. But uh, you either made it or you didn't. When I mean, yeah. there are only those two choices and either the one, and you don't like one choice, then you work towards the only choice okay. that is available and you kind of block the other one out and say, this is what it takes to make it, then this is what I'm doing. And I think that's where uh, we were, you know, everything that uh, I knew, I wanted to make it. Yeah. And this felt like the only way that I would make it if I, uh, you know, uh, embraced it rather than fought it. So, yeah. At that point, what was your first reaction? Because I, we got to know it much later. You must have gotten to know it much earlier. Not really, not very much later than when you guys did. It was a shock to all of us. It was totally unexpected. And uh, uh, I would say, you know, when I went for my treatment, the day the doctor tells me that you have 30% chances of survival, you're on fourth stage. And we're looking, we, we, we've gone to New York. We don't we don't have an apartment, anything. Golden me, only the two of us, because, you know, by the time everybody could be collected or whatever, just the two of us have gone off. And uh, he's like, you know, I'm going to go and look for the, look at the apartments. And I'm like, I'm not sitting here alone moping. I'm coming with you. And at the end of it, when I look at my smartwatch and I see how much, and I've walked 10 kilometers. And I'm like, you know what? When this is what I've heard, and if I can walk and if I can do this, I'm going to survive it. And that was a signal that I'm going to survive it. That night, you know, I, I didn't sleep. I went through that whole night and I woke up saying, this is it. I'm not going to cry over this. This is the last bit of it. I'm going to take it head on and, you know, I'm going to make the most of it. And uh, quite frankly, after that, uh, we did uh, we did treat it like a holiday in, in, uh, in the US with chemotherapy thrown in. <laughs> But you know, I, I was spending so much money, we were like, Goldie and we were like, let's make the most of this holiday. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice way to look at it. It's a very positive way to look at it. But were there moments where you felt like, why me? Like, were there any moment where you felt like that? Listen, I'll... Why me is the most redundant word ever for any situation in life. What does anybody mean by why me? Why not you? I mean, then who else? Everybody has their own yeah. tr struggles. It's just that you don't know it. So you think they don't have it. But that's not true. 
every single person on the face of this earth has their own struggles. Yeah. Just because they're different from yours, you don't think it's a struggle, but it's a struggle for them. So I have never in my life believed in whining. Goldie in an interview said that you didn't want to travel to New York. Yeah. He gave me no choice. He packed me literally like in a day and you know, I was so angry. I was like, you know, I've left everything behind. You've not let me, you know, even shut things down or, you know, I don't even know if I'm going to come back. And he's saying, so then it doesn't matter, no, if yeah. you're not. <laughs> That's what he just told me. So I said, yeah. He's saying, no, we are not. He's just literally in two days, we were out of the country. I don't know. He was working the day in the night. He was, uh, because it was day yeah. in New York, he was coordinating with the doctor. He was like a man possessed. And I don't know how he did it, but. I, I, I would have made it without without him. Exactly, I was going to come to that because you know when, when we talk about your journey, your husband has played a very very important role in it. Yes. And um, uh, I, I'll just say this because uh, there was a point of time in my life when my mom was like really really like I, I lost a pet mm. and uh, I was really upset mm. and my mom was devastated yeah. and my father and my brother and my father were out. Yeah. And she was so much, she was bawling and mm. I, I remember I was a child and my brother called me and said that you can't cry mm. because if you cry then she'll fall weaker. I think when I see Goldie, I feel that he also gave you that strength because if yeah. he fell weak, you would fall weaker. Do you, yeah. do you, do you agree? No, he was, he was my rock. He was, uh, I mean, he was everything. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have had great support from both the sides of my family and our friends. They've been hugely supportive and they were all there. But uh, he was the pivotal point and everybody, he was handling everything and every, he was, everybody was, uh, he was the fulcrum. Yeah. You know, whenever I've heard stories from people who have been through this and battled it, especially, mm. They've always said that more than them, the family gets affected and there, there are certain questions that they beyond a point you're asked that so many times that you get irritated. Were there moments like that where you felt no. like disconnecting? In fact, uh, what you said is a very, very important thing because primary caregivers go through a lot, uh, uh, especially when with, with the kind yeah. of illness uh, this was or this kind of illness. And there must be a lot of other people yeah. who will uh, do that. And, you know, you're all looking at the patient and, you know, and what the patient needs. But the primary caregivers are going through so much mentally and physically because they're dealing with yeah. all of that, that a lot of times you don't pay attention and counseling for the primary caregivers is very, very important. Yeah. At the same time, do you feel like, um, did, did your mental health take a hit? Yes. Because you're did. a very positive person from whatever I've heard from Saitama. Of course Man. it did. It did. Definitely did. But the thing is that um, when you identify, it's important to accept. Yeah. So if you're going to live in denial and say, I'm so strong, this cannot happen to me, then you're living in denial. But accepting the fact that, you know, I can't deal with all of this by myself and there is no shame in asking for help. Yeah. And I got help. I went to an onco psychiatrist. I did my sessions. I, I, it, I took the help. I understood that I can do this also. But sometimes, even if you know the path, sometimes you need somebody who will hold your hand yeah. and take you on that path. Because left to yourself, you might be uh, maybe mentally lazy, reluctant or whatever to actually uh, actually go and do it. So a lot of it also stems from shaming. You know, women, when they battle any disease, they there's no awareness, first of all. I feel that when there are popular faces like you who've come out, and I'll always say this, that you've come out as victor, as a victor, as a survivor. And you've battled it and you've all, when I see you making that one day at a time post, I genuinely know that you're living it. And I genuinely know that you are giving inspiration to many others out there who may not have that source of hope. See, yeah. when you say this, when uh, when I went through this and you know, the kind of response we were getting, uh, I did feel that, you know, everybody's exaggerating it a bit because we are also in a line where everything is always exaggerated yeah. and everything is made into such a big deal and stuff like that. I did feel that. But today I'm looking at it in retrospect. There's a perspective. And uh, four years down the line, uh, I know for a fact that the conversation has changed. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I know for a fact that this conversation was never happening before this, and uh, I didn't intend it to like. Oh, I'm going to start talk about it, talking about not. it. But it was not that. It was just that I wanted people to know the truth, so that there was no gossip around it. Yeah. There was no speculation around it, and there was a very uh, selfish reason for that. My parents, Goldie's mother, my son, our family, they were all here. and i didn't want them to go through the kind of uh, uh, frenzy that happens when there is yeah. speculation and when there is gossip and so i just that's the beauty of social media i could put it out in my own words as to what i was going through and what i was doing to deal with it so my uh, the golden me discussed it and we said i'm going to put it out we put it out and that was the end of it for me the chapter was over and i was not really going to look at it what we didn't realize and accept was the expect was the response that we got yeah and what we real uh, the response that we got was that you know people from all walks of life from all religions from all genders you know and like i said every strata of society uh, from villages to cities were reaching out and saying hey you know i went through this somebody in my family went through this this has happened yeah. to me and it was just so shocking we were in shock i said my god this has been so rampant why did i not know why yeah. did i behave like why do we behave like oh my god cancer it doesn't happen to anybody it happens so rarely it doesn't people are just not talking about yeah. it and hence we get caught by surprise then as i went through it what i realized was that had it been caught earlier i wouldn't have to go through all that exactly. i went through and it wouldn't it doesn't need to become a life and death issue and when you realize that you said oh my god what a waste of time and what a waste of resources because had i known this earlier i would have been prepared uh, doesn't mean i will not get it but that means i will catch it early yeah. i wouldn't have to go through the uh, uh, the amount of harsh treatment that i had to go through because and that's why i said said my god early detection saves lives yeah. i keep saying that because yeah. that is what it is a lot of Or, women don't do tests to no a lot of people don't do yeah. tests because they are like i don't want to know if it is look it's not going to go away and also if it is and it is there is a lot of genetics involved and yeah. if it is in your family then it's better to be tested to test regularly so that you know if it is in your genes not in your genes if it is in your genes then just test it catch it early get rid of it early move on with your life it is as simple as that so when i when we realized that you know this was not something that was spoken about so much and if it is spoken about there is so much that can be done about yeah. it that i decided to share the journey absolutely it was something that affected all of us i feel it will be harsh to say that there have been so many news but that news affected us the most but it did it genuinely did so you know did. what are you saying i uh, just an example because at at one point uh, goldie had gone back and he sent me a a a, a, a picture and the picture of the uh, was of the headlines of uh, the the i don't remember which newspaper had done the this thing and you know after my news came out and after i started speaking about it how much the testing had gone up yeah. you know how many people had gone up and and that is what it was and you know goldie said that you know what baby if you've been through this and if this is the result of it it's worth it yeah you know that's what he yeah. that was the message he had sent me from from there and and i agree with that you know today it's suddenly not so everybody's talking about it so much more casually yeah. and at that four years just four years back it was not like it wasn't. that it and wasn't and so yes that bit today i accept it was important and i'm glad i could make that conversation happen it was a uh, way and it was needed i will also give it up to you and not just again because i'm doing this interview but um for not just accepting but also coming out with the actual reality of what you felt when you were losing your hair you were not like oh i embraced embraced it only you said that it was difficult for me to yeah, embrace it in it the was. beginning it is difficult for anybody even if they come out and say that it wasn't difficult it was easy and i did it it is difficult in the beginning yeah. to what went through your mind because we are all in this glamour industry and there is a definition there is a picture that we have in our minds of everybody see first of all when 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 i realized this was the conversation and when we decided that okay i'm going to share the journey uh the first thing that i said was i don't want sympathy so i yeah. and i'm not going to put this uh you know oh my god weeping crying no that's yeah. not what i'm going to yeah. put out but that doesn't mean i'm going to lie yeah i'm going to be extremely truthful but that doesn't mean while being truthful 
because I want to be positive about it, I will put the positive picture out. I'm not going to hide the pain though. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that was the, the this thing of it. I think I've done every hair product that is out there when I was modeling. Every brand mm. of hair product I must have done. So hair was the literally the crowning glory. Plus being in a profession which is all about looks. Yeah. So yes, uh, uh, it just uh, showed me that I felt that um, you know I was brought up to tr I was brought up when we stood in front of the mirror we got one whack on our head and we were not allowed to look into the mirror too often my parents so and my mother would always say that you know beauty is what is inside and uh, you know this is out of so I was brought up like that and I thought I embodied it and I I know it. Then that little, um, what do you say, uh, the, the little, no, the little uh, guru of youth, you know, that you, uh, that is said that I am doing it, I know it. And then you realize how much you don't know. So this, when you actually live a situation is when you realize that you really don't know, you yeah. think you are, you are not vain, but you are. Yeah. I was very, very, and I still am. I think that I'm live, learning to live with it. But yes, there is that uh, grain of vanity. And looks do, I mean, I would not want it to, but they do. And uh, that's how it has been for me. So it was very, very hard. Was it difficult for you at that point? Did you ever think of getting a wig? Because a lot of people I do, do that. And I then have you lots of, yeah. Huh. I do. Uh, I never really did wear it as much. I still have them. But it was more to wear it like a, and when I, when I, did, when I got it also, I said the wigs are going to be like my hats. So as I wear hats and I change them, you know, one look this and the other look um, uh, short hair and long hair and whatever, if I felt like it. But eventually it was just too much of an effort and actually I, uh, uh, it sounds crazy probably, but it was just so much more easier to not have hair. Um, you just got ready faster <laughs> and you just left the room. <laughs> and you don't so, like <laughs> taking time to get ready is what I've been yeah. told. <laughs> So yeah, I just ended up not really wearing it as much. You know, I'll tell you, uh, from, from a very 90s perspective, like we spoke about, um, we've looked at you as this gorgeous heroine who also knew how to act really, really well. And then... I never when knew that, that, that's what they thought. Uh, because the critics were only ripping me apart always. I don't care. I wish critics. you were a critic then. I am too biased to be a critic and I feel every critic is... A, how, ever was or ever will be is biased negatively or positively but they are not men or women enough to admit it um, <laughs> is how I'm going to put it uh, but I'm biased and it's okay what is the big deal you challenged beauty standards I'll tell you it's not about the disease I know people my age they get affected by comments yeah. they get affected by somebody writing that you're looking too dark in this it yeah. might be the lighting but they get affected yeah. Somebody, I know somebody who worked with me and they were told by somebody ridiculously in front of me that I don't think you should be doing it because you don't know how to make, do makeup. And I got really furious. Like, um, and I told her that no, you will do it and you should and you must. Because it breaks morale at a, after a point of time. And we have those ridiculous beauty standards set, especially yeah. for women in the society. I think you challenge that well. You have battled that all your life. Like as a heroine, you're so you're supposed to look a certain way. You're yeah, supposed I was to. Yeah, the skinniest one. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever been shamed or like? Ki, sometimes why are you looking like this? Why are you looking like yeah, that? Because course. nasty reports were in in during yeah, the nineties. Absolutely, 90s. because uh, being skinny was definitely not the standard of beauty. So voluptuousness was the standard of beauty, and you were just not woman enough if yeah. you were not uh, voluptuous. Having said that, you know, which it shouldn't be. Yeah. And we should definitely, uh, I, I remember coming back and I, uh, I remember speaking to Anaita uh, when, you know, when, when she'd called up and I said, you know, Anaita, I want to do this uh, shoot and I want to do it with, with, with the scar showing because I'm scared uh, to, to show it. And the moment I'm scared, like it's, it's, it's like, I think I'm going to go out only with a wig. I don't know if I should step out with my, the, the, the thing to do was to step out with, without the wig, to step out ball because is this what you're afraid of? Crush it right there, you know. So I was beginning to, that was the scary part. As You know, the bloated face, the scar, and the baldness, and especially when the hair just starts coming. It's just the most ugly sight on the top of your head. It's really not. Uh, but I did that. And um, the point was, uh, uh, I said that the moment you're scared of something and you're feeling that, no, 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 how can I do this? I need to go out and do it. And you know, yeah. just kill it right there or just crush it there. So 
that was uh, one way of looking at it. Having said that, there are definitely a lot of things that need to change. But we've also become a bit too sensitive about things now. Yeah. So I think we are losing that balance. We get offended. We needn't, be, we needn't be on that other side where, you know, things are going so bad that, uh, you know, you can say anything to Offend. other woman and, yeah. you know, body shame her. I, you know, I do agree that body shaming should not have any part yeah. in, in our society and especially little girls and, you know, the kind of ideas that they're growing with. Uh, you know, the kind of crazy uh, dieting that people are doing, which really affects the health. The, the you know people are forgetting that it's it's holistic and health is holistic it's not just this part yeah. needs to be like this and that part needs it's, it's in the entirety even your mind it, it's all it it needs to be balanced uh, but having said that we are also reaching a stage where at, as as soon as there's criticism <laughs> we are all getting so touchy about it but we have to understand that criticism needs to be taken constructively and sometimes we should you should be able to criticize you know proper gentle True. way without being nasty or yeah. mean you know but uh, how are you going to improve if you don't know that something is not right you will need to be told that this can be better if you you have to accept that and yeah. you have to be able to tell that you know when you talk about being nasty mm -hmm. mm, i have read i still of course i was not a journalist i was not even old enough to read stories in the 90s but i know because we still read those throwback stories which are like vicious vain while mm -hmm. everything it's nasty to another level it attacks somebody's personality it gets into somebody's like insides and outsides like anything what were the nastiest things you've read because when you started off you were really really young yeah. it could have affected your mental space did it ever get to that uh, yes, it did. Of course, it did. You are affected and you kind of uh, develop a thick skin eventually, but it's never thick enough, actually. <laughs> you kind of fool yourself saying that, ah, now I don't get affected, but you do. You always get affected, even today. Uh, the degree gets better, or you learn to live with it or you learn to ignore it. But of course, that one second of that little bit uh, does happen. Yeah. But what were the things that you read that really affected you? Do you so, remember? you know, I, honestly, um, uh, anything that I really don't like, I block it off and I um, move on from it or put it in the past and I don't look into it then, look into past. I don't live with, reg I, I try and I really, really try very hard to not live with regrets and I definitely don't live in the past. So, uh, not that I remember uh, like a particular story so much, but I remember the whole, uh, as soon as you were uh, confident or friendly, then you know, there were always these nasty inundos and connections that would be made with the, with the, with the actor or the director, which was very uncalled for. Yeah. And it always affected the um, atmosphere on the set or, you know, your friendship with the yeah. person and, you know, just... Uh, uh, not a happy atmosphere so that sort of a thing i think one thing that i remember because i i remember asking uh, um, you know you mentioned sarita so mm. i remember asking uh, her about it uh, one of my uh, colleagues at that point of time they had written about this person and about the background that this person came from and how they came from such humble background and you know look now they were just showing off about it so much and they were uh, talking about it like this and you know but actually they come yeah. from this this background and this is where they there was a huge thing about it and I remember asking that is it a crime to come from a humble background I come from an even humbler background what's the problem mm. I mean you know tomorrow you will take off on me and why is it, a, is it a crime? Do we decide what background we come from? And how can you judge True. somebody on that? And uh, I remember uh, the reply that I got and they said, but you've never hidden where you came from. You're always open about it and you've spoken about it. Yeah. And uh, this person has always painted a very different picture. And so once when they lie, then you, then you, you have something uh, that, you know, you, we can dig into and, you know, yeah. kind of say that, oh, this person is lying. I said, still uncalled for because uh, I don't agree with that. But uh, I remember that as a lesson. It was something that I always ticked in my head that, you know, just accept what it is. Because the moment you've accepted it and you are saying it, yeah. what can you say worse than that? I've said it myself. I know what it is. And this is what it is. This is the truth. Yeah. The moment something is the truth, you can't fight it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can't call it names. Absolutely. Because truth is. And so I've always tried to be as truthful as I can be. 
Yeah, and that is something that I have been told as well. That you have always been one of the most honest human beings ever. Like you've said it as is, or not said at all. Yeah, but do you think that has somewhere worked against you ever in 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 terms of professional work? And do you sometimes feel like today I am gloating, literally gloating? But I want to know that. Uh, do you sometimes feel that there was a point of time when you wanted to explore your true potential, and there were films like Zakham. There was a film like yeah. uh, Sir Farosh. Um, honestly, I loved you in Duplicate because I feel that um, your comedy was impeccable, and we never really had uh, heroines doing comedy except you and Juhi Ma'am in the nineties. To be very yeah. honest, in that space, you know, accepted, but it was not explored. Do you feel that somewhere it was left unexplored? Yeah, because you know the looks took over, and uh, it the the looks overshadowed most of the uh, things. It was it was more like. Uh, Everything was more about the looks, and uh, uh, so, so the thing is now that it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. If you're going to complain about that fact, then you should be complaining about complaining about the fact that you got into the industry and you got the amount of work that you got because of the looks. Yeah. So now suddenly the looks can't become the villain of the piece and say, you know, they're only looking at my looks and not giving me the other opportunity. So yes, I did not uh, get that. In fact, there was I'm forgetting the name of the film. It was a Ram Gopal Verma film directed by E Nivas and Saif and me were the couple and Fardeen and Twinkle were there in it. Mm, love ke liye kuch bhi karega. It was mad and how much and there was and you know we had such a blast doing that because we were just we were just created and. And and what you said is true. I know I have that uh, timing, and I enjoy it, and it comes very naturally. It's so, a cult. <laughs> Excuse me. And you know, believe me, we would just make it on the set. Literally, we would be making it on the set. You know, and we were having so much fun, oh my God. improvising while we were doing it, and we would just like really be having a blast uh, doing it. So, Sir Farosh John had seen that in me as a as as a. As a model, and you know, he was the one who first gave me that opportunity to be do that little uh, comic timing yeah. kind of a zone, as you see it. But yeah, other than that, it did uh, get stuck with the looks a bit, but no complaints. It's okay. But uh, the, now I shall do it. Absolutely, I think the times <laughs> have also changed. No, yeah. no, times have completely changed, and I feel I'll tell you why. I'll come to that in the next question. But there was a point where you took a break after you became a mother. Yeah. Uh, was it a conscious move? It was very conscious. Yeah. I wanted that time to be with my uh, my child's time, and uh, honestly, in my head, it was more like about eight, seven to eight years. And I've always said it that I had the luxury of taking the time off. A lot of mothers yeah. don't have the luxury. You need that time. You need that time. Your body has gone through a lot. Your mind has gone through a lot, and you're uh, you know you're dealing with a lot of stuff. And I do feel that one parent needs to be around. Yeah. And uh, uh, at any given point of time, I was taking on work which kept me around my child, and I wouldn't go on outdoors. So uh, even today, if you, now not so much, but we've always, uh, whenever I have been very deep into work, is when Goldie is prepping, or uh, not really on 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 floor, but when he is on set, then I'm at home. So we've done that, you know. I think if you. You know, nobody forces you to. In today's day and age, it's yeah. not our thing that you need to have a child. If you're bringing a, uh, you know, if you're bringing a life into this world, you better do your best. Yeah. You know, to you're molding that brain. I mean, it's a responsibility. I want my child to be a good human being. I, I, and I, he need, is. I, I hope so. Only time will tell. We don't know. I, I can only hope for it, and I can work towards it. End result, I might not be here to see it, or it will be later. But whenever it is, I can only hope for the best result, and of course, be that's the it. least I can do if I'm bringing a life into this world. You know, when why I asked you this and why I broke, uh, spoke about my mother is because uh, my mother read a news, mm. and the news had everything about the, all the details, but more than what you were battling, my mother's whole thing was like your about the age of your child. Yeah, he was twelve years old when this happened. Yeah, yeah. and uh, she just kept. Telling me that, and like you know, you know, you know, and everybody was reporting everything in Bengali. It was reported in something else. It was yeah. made to be very severe. It was. <laughs> it was severe, but something else. Like there were, there were. It, it was, it was something else completely. So, breaking the news to your child was it difficult at that point? Did you involve him through every stage of the disease? When I, I read somewhere that you did a scan and you got to know that it spread to. Yeah, he, he was not here at that point of time. He was on a, on on a on a trip, 
on a summer camp and uh, I, I was supposed to go and pick him up from the summer camp and uh, uh, my sister went to pick him up. So she was like, how come Masi has come to pick him up? And she said that, you know, that there had been change of plans and we told him on the phone that, you know, uh, we are going to the US and not uh, Europe. And he said, oh, okay, plans have changed. She said, yeah, I just... Um, so we said, okay, the, this is what it was and he came to the US. But later on now, when we speak to him later, and he said, you know, I was always wondering, how come Masi is there and the cousins were not there? And how come she's on a holiday? And she, you know, he asked her that also, that if you're going on a holiday to the US, how come you've come on a holiday without... He took his cousin's names. How come you've come on a holiday without them? So she said that, and she said that, she said, you know, he has asked me this. And she said, you know, I needed some me time and she has twins. So she said, you know, it was just getting so overwhelming. I needed some me time. So I just wanted to come to my sister for a little while. So he said, hmm, okay. But he, later on, he was telling me, I always thought that it was a bit odd that she was doing that. It didn't feel like her. So who broke the news to him? You did? Uh, when we landed, uh, Goldie broke the news to him. And I... You know, he. I've seen few things, a few videos because Shishti keeps putting and Shishti's son also keeps yeah. putting those pictures. Um, a vibe hota hai. You can see somebody and feel that this is a good child. Like, I would like to believe that that is how it is because my mother says it like that. He's well brought up. So is Shishti's uh, son. Yeah. I, I, I want to know, how did he react? Did you feel, like parents feel that, oh, will he be able to take it? But did he take it well? Like sometimes kids can surprise you. Yeah. They always surprise us. Not sometimes, always. And uh, I don't think lying is a good option, you know, yeah. because uh, kids always know. And what happens is that when they don't know the truth, they think they've done something wrong. Yeah. And uh, so the thing is that do I want my child to think that he's to be blamed for something and something he's done wrong? Or uh, uh, there was never, it was, it was not, there was no doubt in mine and Goldie's head that this uh, was not going to be done together because he's family how can I keep him away from it he has yeah. to be part of it and it's just that how we make him the part of it was what was up to us Goldie told him that when he landed uh, when he got into the car when he went to pick him up he said that look this is what it was and uh, I know you will be surprised but uh, we're here because you know we've come for mama's treatment and uh, she's not well um, she says she's going to be okay, but uh, uh, she needs a specialized treatment and we, we have come for over here. And uh, uh, Zanir has been uh, asthmatic as a child, so he just reaches into his backpack and takes out his pump and uh, takes a, uh, you know, because that obviously anything, any stress kind of triggers that off and he takes his uh, medicine, puff of that and, um, and he just uh, sits there absolutely quietly. And then he told Goldie that, you know, I've read a book with Mama and uh, uh, a child my age goes through it because his sibling goes through it. Uh, you know, Papa, it's not going to be easy for the family. It's, it's it, this, 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 uh, this disease. He asked, what is it? So he told him cancer and that's when he said that I've read about, we've read a story together, we've read a book together, Mama and me. And it's very difficult for the family, you know, a lot of equations change, things change in the family. So I thought, uh, yet again, I would say books to my rescue. <laughs> Absolutely. <But laughs> what would we do without books? Absolutely. Um, but now when you're coming back, uh, there, you're doing a show and uh, there is a digital uh, debut waiting. Yeah. I just want to know that um, how much precautions do you take around you for your health? Like I knew and I genuinely give it up uh, to your entire team and I understand the situation when they, when we couldn't do this the last yeah. two seasons because of course the situation was something we've been through a pandemic and honestly I wouldn't want anything like not even, yeah. this interview is not important, as Thank important as you. your Thank health. Thank you for understanding. But I will tell you this that uh, I'm being as careful as you should be. Uh, yeah. We are, the times that we are living yeah. in are unprecedented and nobody has really, nobody really knows yeah. how it's going to be, what it is going to be. We are all kind of living each day as it comes yeah. where this One pandemic day. is concerned. Yeah. So uh, I would just say that I kind of got a heads up on it because I was living the mass sanitized life uh, in any case. So I just had a bit of heads up on it. I was well prepared for it is what I would say. 
but yeah so uh, but it's been for years and i'm doing really well and i'm not in fact i've reached a stage where i'm not even on medication so it was good to kind of uh, go and attempt to do this show this show was shot more in mumbai where doctors were close by and all of that uh touch wood it has gone off so well i have enjoyed it so much in fact i'm doing another show right now so it's given me a lot of confidence and i'm so ready to go out there and uh, you know take on more work also because not just because uh, pandemic is ending but also my son is has turned 16 now yeah. and i think he doesn't need a mother hovering over him all the time uh, for him to grow into uh an independent uh, human being he needs to be given space yeah. and uh, you know the the trick about any relationship is to understand when to give space and Absolutely. it's not just between a mother and a child but every relationship on earth you need to understand when to give space when to be there when to you know kind of just back off a bit and i think my my son is growing up he needs to make his own mistakes because everything cannot be he will need to learn from it and the earlier he makes those mistakes the better it is yeah. because they are younger he still has the support where it can be he can learn the lessons yeah. from it so i need to let him have the space to make them absolutely ma'am and um, i have to tell you this that uh, you will remain an emotion uh to me and many others who have known you uh today is the first time i'm genuinely sitting and talking to you and i'll tell you one thing very honestly um this show has a tagline uh it says um, if she can you can yeah. and i don't think anybody anybody or anybody's story or anybody's journey embodies that as well as yours and uh, i hope to see more of you now and uh, i hope to have more conversations with you i know this was a little deep and serious uh, but at the same time i just know that this conversation possibly is going to give hope and encouragement to all those men and women out there who are battling some crisis in life and yeah. thinking why me and they shouldn't be thinking why it's them thank you so much thank you thank you for it next time let's we'll do a lighter one yeah <laughs> we will we'll do we'll yeah. do a, we'll do dance reels on all your songs <laughs> <laughs> oh no what did i unleash <laughs> but thank you so much thank you thank you so much hi i'm sonali bendre and i just shared my journey on bollywood bubble uh please watch it and if you like it please like share and subscribe